And now we're going to talk about something that matters to both of us, uh, but perhaps with a bit different context. We're both runners. Uh, she happens to be a vegan. I'm a, a aspiring vegetarian. And uh, it's sort of relevant because when I was marching with her campaign in the parade, uh, we got vegetable costumes. Yes, indeed. I got to dress as a pumpkin, and there were radishes and carrots and... And the, I don't know of any so other watermelon. Yeah, watermelon. Yeah, watermelon. And, uh, yeah. Oh, pea. It was the pea. Right. Oh, yes, the pea pod. Yeah. And, and so this value I think of as just um, something that should be a person's right to at least try to eat healthy, try to find vegetables, which I know in a lot of places there are food deserts and it can be too expensive to get all the nutrients you need, but there's an entire other context that Lorig is going to discuss and under the whole theme of, of food justice. So yeah. Why don't we explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so there's a lot of pieces to food justice, but what, what food justice is, is sort of taken a, it's a justice and equity lens to the issue of food. And so we look at a number of pieces of it. So some of it is about access. It's about recognizing that what we call food deserts we need to look at with a critical eye and understand how those food deserts came to be. Because deserts, there's some criticism of even using that term. Mm. Deserts are a natural phenomenon, and food deserts don't just randomly, it's not just that it happens that that neighborhood doesn't have any access to healthy food. That's the result of decades of uh, government redlining, it's where investment happened, it's the um, it's all of the sort of things that led to, to, to concentrated poverty that was um, concerted government policy that led to concentrated poverty and subsequently led to the fact that in those communities there is very little access to grocery stores, healthy food, but a lot of access to processed food um, and unhealthy food. So that's, that's a, that context, recognizing the reality of food deserts and where they come from is one piece of the, of the food justice sort of puzzle. Um, the other piece that's related to it, again, coming back to this issue about like why it's so uh, difficult, especially for low-income people to get access to healthy food, is that there is a concerted, um, again, government policy to subsidize corn um, grown on a mass scale, and cheap corn has led to cheap soda, has led to cheap processed food, which is available, again, in low-income communities, and if you have a very limited dollar and you're trying to get full, you're, it's a very rational choice to pick what is long-term unhealthy but in the short term um, at least fills you up and it's physically present in your community. So there's this much bigger picture about uh, food and unjust government policy that leads us to the reality of unhealthy food in, in um, and actually the new word, wait, actually uh, it's, it's um, food swamps. Ah, food swamps huh. is a word that I'm hearing now because it's not just that there's no healthy food, that's the desert. It's that it's a swamp with like the, you know, the swamp of the unhealthy food in that in that community. Oh, maybe that's the kind of swamp we need to drain. That's, that's the, that is one of the swamps we need to drain. So the other piece, though, of food justice that's really important is that when we start to address, like how, when we start to look at this issue of like how do we... Um, change the access to food. We don't want to just make healthy food accessible. We want to do that in a way that people who have been disenfranchised have the power and the control in bringing that food into their communities and have wealth building opportunities from the production of that food. So for example, what that means is that we are uh, doing urban agriculture and the people who are deciding about that urban agriculture are the people from that community who have historically been disenfranchised and the farmers, and you know, we have the worker-owned co-ops or the farmers who, uh, small farmers, low-income folks who have been left out of these kinds of opportunities in the past have a chance to um, build a farm, urban or rural, um, and and um, build wealth for their family through that process or small food businesses um, that we develop infrastructure such, such as the shared use community kitchen that we built here in Tacoma Park um, where uh, folks who don't have much in the way of assets can get a small food business off the ground and create wealth for their family through being part of uh, the 
local food system. So it's really about looking kind of big picture, understanding um, historical racism and um, policies that have led to these food swamps, food deserts, whatever we're gonna call them. Um, and, then, and then as we start to change that, that it's not just about access to healthy food, that's a key piece of it, but it's about how, do, how are people um, who have been disenfranchised in the driver's seat figuring out how to bring that healthy food, culturally relevant food to their communities, and then how can they not just earn income from it, but also do wealth building through that process. Wow, that's a very multifaceted. Oh, what can you tell me about this food kitchen we have here? Well, uh, so the shared the Crossroads Community Food Network, I have been on the board for the last seven years, president for six. Um, and we were the first in the country to double the value of federal nutrition benefits spent at market. So back in 2007, um, in Langley Park, which would be considered a food desert in terms of uh, difficulty accessing um, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, in that community, uh, we built, we started the Crossroads Farmers Market. And when people spend five dollars of their federal nutrition benefits, their SNAP food stamps or WIC. Uh, they get $10 worth of produce. So in 2007, when we came up with this idea, nobody else was doing it. Um, in fact, because the USDA tried to shut it down from a bureaucratic perspective, um, people on the board threatened to go to the Washington Post, and so they backed off. Now, fast forward um, several years, and the USDA, uh, it was actually, it's considered a national model, and it is, um, that approach is in the, uh, farm bill so that there are competitive brands across this country so other farmers markets can do that and last year uh, in the General Assembly we passed a bill to expand it in Maryland so that so that approach is important in and of itself one because it gives direct access to healthy food it stretches the dollar you know, stretches people's food stamp money to get access to healthy food and two because it makes farmers markets financially viable in areas that are food deserts that otherwise it might not be financially viable for a farmer's market to set up. So that's a really important model in and of itself. Um, but then what happened is once we started doing that and doing outreach and being successful, and this is sort of the shift I was talking about from food access to food justice, right, started to make that shift, people started coming and saying, well, this is great and I really appreciate it, but really long-term to feed my family, what I need is you know, more income than I have. And if I could start a business, if I could sell my fill in the blank, Senegalese beignets, pupusas, whatever it was, here at the market, I could start a business um, and, uh, you know, address this broader economic issue. And so we really wanted people to be able to do that. Um, and as we started looking around, what would it take for them to be able to do that? What was missing was access to a commercially licensed kitchen, because you can't, of course, sell food uh, publicly if you don't have a commercially licensed kitchen and as we looked at where there were licensed kitchens the handful of shared use kitchens and there are it's a growing movement and so it's very exciting we actually uh, there are some great ones but even the ones that existed tended to be available if you had a certain amount of assets if you had um, you know the house you could mortgage or that you know like so still not available to people who were literally living paycheck to paycheck and so we realized that one of the things that was missing in the mix was a shared use kitchen where people who were living paycheck to paycheck but had passion and dedication and skills um, could really get their business off the ground and so we started working on it and we have built the this shared use community kitchen here in Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church partnership between Crossroads Community Food Network and Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. We opened um, in uh, July of this year, 2017, and people are growing their businesses and it's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds like a win for everyone. A win for a community, is a win for health, a win for small businesses. It's, it is, and wait, there's one more win. Let me talk about the environment All right. for a second. Oh, wow. So of course, right. So there's this issue of food miles. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or if your viewers listen to it. Maybe. So right, it makes sense. So, so if you look at your food, most of it has traveled very, very far, right? So you had the tomatoes that were grown in um, Florida, let's say, and then they traveled to Texas where they were processed into tomato sauce, and then they traveled somewhere else, and then they made it to your grocery store. So those tomatoes. Um, used a lot of, you know, like um, 
used a lot of resources, fossil fuels generally, had a significant carbon impact to get to your plate. Um, and so the idea is if we can grow the tomatoes in you know, northern Virginia, process them in Tacoma Park, and sell them in Silver Spring, you cut down on the food miles of those tomatoes that became tomato sauce on your pasta or whatever it was. Um, and now that's a much smaller carbon footprint for your food. Um, and so it has this additional benefit in terms of the impact on the environment. It's one more win for your list. Wow, that doesn't seem to be any drawback. Well, yeah, no, it's good. It's a good model. Yeah. Now, another thing I, I really like about this is because um, I always kind of bought along to the narrative that farmers markets were pricey and you know, kind of not elitist, but you know, some something that was a privilege, mm -hmm. and that um, if someone is living paycheck to paycheck, they usually have to resort to like a big box grocery store, mm -hmm. which may or may not have fresh foods. I mean, some may be getting better, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. yeah, there's a movement yeah. to even get groceries in corner stores. So there's there's a movement, but it's a we're a long way from where we need to be. Yeah. Now I do have to ask, um, does a uh, organic or conventional food is that at all relevant to to this initiative or because some people say that's important some people say it's more of a buzzword is that i mean i know you're cutting down on the food footprint but does that apply to the way something's processed or the way it's grown sure well so i think that um that the more uh the the long-term health for our bodies and for our planet um, require that we really minimize the use of chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers. And um, so we know, I don't want to get too far into agriculture, mm -hmm. but uh, we know, for example, if we take care of soil and treat it well, and if we don't do monocultures, but we do the sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, having the diversity of crops and the crop rotation and giving soil a break sometimes and all of those kinds of things that that's better for the environment it's better for the bay it's better for, for all of those things and it's also healthier for our bodies um, the reality of certified organic is that there there are a lot of hoops to jump through and so I think you might find that um, a farmer who may be growing in a very sustainable way um, isn't able to meet the hoops of certified but I was so like when I'm buying my vegetables from small farmers often they can't get certified because of the bureaucratic hoops. Um, but I have conversations with them about like, tell me about your growing practices. Um, Cause I am looking for people who are growing in ways that are healthier for the earth and, um, and I believe healthier for me. Um, but in the end, I think more fruits and vegetables is always better for your body. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not, sh I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I, I think that, um, fruit or vegetable that was grown? That's an interesting question. Is it better than a potato chip? Um, <laughs> I suspect that uh, fruits and vegetables, even if they're grown conventionally, are better for our bodies than, um, you know, hostess cupcakes. So, um, so let's make the shift as much as we can. Yeah. I mean, th that makes a lot of sense. Um, I know there are probably varying shades of, of this all. You know, when I personally go to a grocery store, I'll try to buy something organic, but sometimes it's if it's several dollars more, I would think, well, what harm is it for conventional? If it's still a vegetable, it's still going to be better than, than something else, maybe. Um, so even though this is just one component of food justice, I was curious about the food swamps, I guess. That I, I like the imagery here. Uh, where exactly would be a food swamp in Montgomery County? I mean, I live in Tacoma Park, not, not far from you. And I have multiple grocery stores or markets in walkable or bikeable distance. And everywhere that I go in Montgomery County seems to be pretty close to a place to shop. But where, where is kind of left out, would you say? And where are you targeting with, with this corner market initiative? Yeah, well, I think, but the, the other thing I think that's important to, to remember um, about the relative size of sort of food swamps. There's certainly areas where there's like, there's certainly cities and, and areas where there's sort of massive food swamps. But the other thing is that if somebody doesn't have, um, if someone's um, 
limited in their mobility, either physically, their own physical mm -hmm. mobility to move around, or um, if they're dependent on public transportation, which many people in Montgomery County are, um, then even a trip to a grocery store that's not too far away um, is much more, and, and if they have a family that they're feeding, and if they have several children, if they have small children, you know, like it all gets very complicated very quickly to bring back um, large amounts of fresh fruits and vegetables for, you know, a week from, you know, someplace that is maybe not as the crow flies that far away, but is maybe two bus, you know, two different bus trips with, yeah. you know, That's three small hassle. children yeah. with a bunch of stuff and with a, you know. And so I think that a lot of times people who are making policy or building the, you know, programs kind of imagine, and I'm not suggesting that you are necessarily, but, but imagine, it's, it's worth thinking about, like imagine themselves grocery shopping with a car. Mm -hmm. um, and so that may or may not be the reality of the experience. So really to, to kind of figure out where the um, a sort of challenging areas are, I think requires looking at it from the perspective of, okay, if somebody lived here, what's the trip from here on public transportation um, to, to, to get access to healthy food? Um, and that, that's kind of how you want to think about it because there's, there's additional layers, I think, to it. Uh, no, that's really important to, to figure out. I mean, as just a, I'm just shopping for myself, like I said, oh, I have a choice. I could drive to um, Safeway and Silver Spring. I could walk to Aldi and, and I mm -hmm. guess it's Langley, I sort of Tacoma, New Hampshire Avenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could walk up to the farmer's market or the co-op if I wanted to spend mm -hmm. a little more. Mm -hmm. um, I could bike over right. with a backpack, but not everyone has all these yeah. these options and to carry groceries on the bus is yeah. and for and for more than one person it, it, yeah, yeah for family yeah. it's not easy um and not everyone has the time if i w personally wanted to walk somewhere it would take 20 minutes or so to get there each yeah. way and uh with several small children that may not be so sure. easy it's yeah easy to overlook these things yeah yeah and it's easy, and it's easy to judge people. I think too. Um, I think one of the most uh, offensive things when Crossroads Farmers Market was getting started, and so there was this targeted piece about um, what we were going to do was make healthy food accessible to low-income people in our community. You know, our neighbors and our friends who don't have uh, the resources to buy healthy food at the Tacoma Park Farmers Market, for example, um, and people said. Um, you know, and this is sort of a quote uh, that, you know, well, those people, which is, you always know it's going to be offensive when mm -hmm. it starts with that, you know, but, but basically saying that low income people don't want to eat that way, that it's a choice that they're making, that um, culturally people don't want to eat that food. Um, and so that's um, offensive, it's racist, it's classist, but it's also wrong, it's inaccurate. And um, and what we have found is that consistently every year we run out of um, the food that we, we call it uh, fresh checks, the, the money that we raise to double the value of federal nutrition benefits. There's such uh, um, interest in it. There's so much demand that, that we have run out every year of the fresh checks that we raise, you know, $60,000 of it, um, before, the end, before the end of the year. So um, clearly there is a demand and it's a matter of access and it's a matter of both financial and physical access to the healthy food. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask next. I mean, uh, given this this initiative, and, and how many have these been set up around the area, would you say? So the well, Crossroads Farmers Market is in this area. There are now, um, in the state of Maryland, I think that there's 20 in Maryland, um, don't hold me to that, uh, where there is a doubling, some kind of incentives um, most of them have a much smaller budget than Crossroads does uh, to do it so uh, it's not quite at the same scale as Crossroads but but there's 20 in the state where people can get some amount of doubling of their federal nutrition benefits and um, and we passed the legislation last year and we're trying to get the governor now to put money into it uh, because there's several hundred farmers markets in the state so ideally we would have it available you know at all of them but we're not there yet. Oh, well, maybe you'll get there. But uh, oh, we intend to. Just hopefully that, sooner rather than yeah, later. Yeah, that that would be great. And I was curious about the 
the results of it um, to uh, I'm not even really gonna play devil's advocate but s someone who might make a comment starting with those people or anyone who assumes that it, that unhealthy eating is a choice um, they may hypothesize that even if accessible healthy food were there that they may still make unhealthy choices have you found or is, are, is there any data that has showed um, that has backed up the increase in demand or increase in consumption of these vegetables and sure. nice things available yeah 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 so let me just be clear unhealthy eating can be a choice there's plenty of people both with and without right. access to sufficient income who make unhealthy eating choices so it's not and, and i certainly have periods in my life where i've made those choices but um so it's not that i'm saying it's never a choice right um it's just that it's it's um i'm just saying that it's inaccurate to say that um the reason that the vast majority of lower income folks uh are you know are able to eat, eat uh, veg, fruits and vegetables is more of this issue about access um, and so yes there has so wholesome wave is a national organization that promotes this model that we have at crossroads um, and they have done studies and found that families will report an increase in um, consumption of fruits and vegetables as a result of this program being present in their communities. The other really interesting thing that, that Wholesome Wave is working on and um, that we're doing a little bit of here in, in Langley Park and hoping to expand uh, further is actually fruit and vegetable prescriptions where you have healthcare providers who are treating people with let's say diabetes or other diet or pre-diabetes or other diet related um, illnesses um, and actually can write prescriptions and then those prescriptions those prescriptions can be essentially redeemed not just saying eat more fruits and vegetables but the prescriptions are like ten dollars worth of vegetables at crossroads farmers market so the prescriptions can be redeemed um, at the market and um, and that's you know that is the uh, sort of the next step with it and working with hospitals and those kinds of things. Oh, so this is all kinds cool of really idea. interesting. Yeah, there's really cool stuff that, that can be connected to it too. Yeah, that's a cool idea and, and just back to almost primitive common sense as opposed yes. to a $700 pill that yeah. would attempt to do the same thing with a million side effects. Yeah. Another rabbit hole. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's such a cool idea. Now, how do you imagine um, trying to move forward with this or accelerate this in, at the state level in the yeah. legislature. So thanks. There's actually there's some really cool things that we can do that sort of scale up this model. So at a, um, a very simple thing that we can do is put money into the Farms and Food Act, which makes at least this doubling the value of federal nutrition benefits at farmers markets available across the state now. So that's something that can happen without a lot of you know, changes to infrastructure or those kinds of things. Um, but this idea when I was talking about like food miles and economic opportunity, we actually have this incredible opportunity in Maryland to really look at our food system as a way to do a number of things. One, to increase access to healthy food. Two, to create economic opportunity especially and wealth building opportunity, especially for people who have been historically denied those opportunities. Um, three, to address some of the environmental issues. Um, and, and then for just to grow income and economics in the state. So, um, so one, so for example, we can um, support new farmers, small farmers, um, farmers who are doing sustainable growing practices, um, farmers who have diversity of crops, who are caring for their soil. Um, so we can create opportunities and incentives to increase that in Maryland. And then we can support them with a distribution system that gives them access to anchor institutions, uh, gives them access to um, a broader market. So for example, right now, if you look at hospitals and universities, for the most part, they're not buying from 27 small farmers to get the tomatoes that they need for the dining hall, right? That's a very difficult thing to do. But if we do something like creating a food hub or some kind of aggregation system and distribution system, we actually could give all of those small farmers who are growing in ways that we want to incentivize, we could give them access to um, these really important markets, the anchor institutions in our, in our community. Um, and so this food hub idea or a distribution system sort of makes that connection and really, again, grows, grows our agricultural um, system and, and the opportunity there. 
Um, but then on top of that, we can add a process processing facilities where um, folks can start small food processing businesses, whether that's the farmers themselves processing their product or somebody else. So again, taking this community kitchen model kind of to scale a little bit. Um, and there is some conversation here in Montgomery County to do something along those lines, or there was at least um, on the Ag Reserve, where you can then create opportunities. I was talking about the tomato that instead of going from Florida to Texas to Minnesota to Maryland, um, you know, could just travel 15 miles to the processing plant and then 30 miles to um, University of Maryland's dining hall uh, as tomato sauce. Um, so there's, there's a lot of opportunities to sort of scale up some of those ideas that we've done in a very small scale way here in, in, this, in this community um, in a way that really makes a difference in the economy for the state, um, in the food miles in the state, which is, is, a, is a carbon impact. Um, and and in, in economic opportunity for people who have been excluded from that, um, and in our health, our physical health. Sure, I think you can win over some fiscal conservative support for you know helping small businesses out and decreasing some costs associated with that. I, th I think there is a possibility for some real um, broad support on these issues. We have to frame them right and, um, and make sure we keep the equity and justice lens as we're kind of building it. But I do think that we can get some broad support uh, and that would be great. Well, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, it looks like so we've got already? this. We just getting started. It goes We're by so started. fast. Yes, yeah, it, it, it looks like we, we did manage to uh, cover everything in under an hour. Right. Um, some Sorry. people are not able to do that. Okay. But, uh, you know, this, uh, you thanks for going so far in depth onto both of these really <laughs> complex and nuanced issues. And that is the my goal with, with my project. And uh, I hope that other candidates can find ways to really completely explain what what gets them going, why they seek to have this kind of influence, and to, instead of trying to condense everything to one page or one tweet, yeah, you can't fit this all. Can't do it in a tweet, <laughs> but, but I'll tweet the link to this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, thank you, Lori. Right, thank you so again. much for the opportunity. It was. A lot of fun and very informative. I've learned a lot from this, and I hope uh, you all viewers are, are learning something too. Great. Thank you. All right. Have a good night.